Perfect. All right. So uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're following us from. So the goal of this um, lecture is to introduce the Gasweiler approximation or equivalently the rotational invariance lay boson uh, mean field equations. Today I will do it from the GA perspective uh, because of some recent developments that have been that I want to mention uh, that have been formulated from this perspective, but the two formalism are in principle equivalently equivalent, and I'm going to also mention something about it. Uh, the main goal is to give the background necessary for um, uh, using uh, uh, the for 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 um, for the um, introduction uh, for, for to the hands-on training for the, that is going to be presented by Yongxin later. Um, the formalism that I'm going to use uh, is based mainly on these two on these two references. So uh, it's, a, it's it's going to be formulated this method as a quantum embedding uh, theory. And uh, before to get into uh, how the theory works and into formal things, uh, let me say a few words about uh, what, why is it useful? So you have uh, uh, already learned about uh, different methods, dynamic and field theory and, uh, and uh, different extensions of it. So why should one also learn uh, this particular method? So I point out three uh, key reasons. Uh, the first one is that it's, orders of magnitude less computationally demanding than the MFT. So it's relatively fast. Um, and, uh, and I will be very precise about why and how much. Uh, and also there are recent developments, uh, for example, about how to combine this with machine learning that may make this method basically as fast as classic approximation to DFT. So that's a key reason. Another reason I want to mention it, this is variation. This is a variational method. So what this means uh, uh, is that we have no problem reaching zero temperature. Uh, while uh, you, have, you have heard yesterday about CTQMC, for example, going to very low temperature can be problematic computational in some cases. So this makes this method complementary uh, to the MFT in this sense. And finally, and this is about some recent developments, I will say something towards the end uh, of the lecture, assuming there will be time. Uh, the accuracy can actually be improved systematically. And in particular, I will uh, mention some recent extension that is called Ghost uh, GA. Uh, these are, these are the, the, the reasons why this is uh, useful, uh, but of course there are limitations that you need to keep in mind. And I po point out three again, so first of all, this method does not give uh, an accurate description of the mode phase. It does capture the mode transition. That's absolutely important. Uh, but the way how the mode phase is described is somehow oversimplified in the bare version of this method. So in particular, the method does not capture the fact that there can be uh, charge fluctuations in the mode phase. So it, it, it gives a bit of an oversimplified version of, uh, of what mode phase means. Uh, the second point is that um, this method give you some access to spectral properties that, that are driven by correlation, such as band renormalization, but you cannot get access uh, to um, high energy ex excitation. So the Hubbard bands are not captured. And the third point is that uh, even though, as I mentioned, the mod transition is captured, uh, sometimes uh, in, in the phase diagram, it can be, um, a bit overestimated in the sense that you need uh, to use an a, a interaction strength that is a little bit too high uh, to get the mod transition. And this is related with the fact that there is no uh, very accurate description of the mod phase. But the note that I want to make is that all of these three uh, points are actually connected to each other. And as it turns out, they can be cured. Uh, and I will try to show you um, how. And this will all be based on the same formalism that I will explain today. I will focus on the standard version of the method that is what you will use in the tutorial uh, in the afternoon. Uh, but uh, um, it's really the same formalism with just some little difference at the very beginning. Uh, OK, so why is computational speed important? So I mentioned this as the key reason why you should learn this method. Why is computational speed important? So 
First of all, uh, from the point of view of fundamental science, what we want to do is, of course, to understand the behavior uh, of matter at the many body scale. And this often requires to explore large chemical spaces. So this is a, a situation where you really want to look at trends. So you need to learn to explore maybe uh, many, many uh, chemical substitutions or different pressures of, uh, or values of interaction strength to really capture what is the main physics going on. And these are just two example publications based on the code that you're going to use uh, today where really uh, computational speed was key uh, for, for, uh, for making uh, this, this work possible. But there is also another very important uh, aspect besides the purely fundamental science. Uh, um, and this is the fact that uh, materials uh, are not just platforms for uh, understanding the fascinating behavior of matter at the many body scale. They're also useful for, they're also useful for society. And, and now we are really living in a, in, in a new era about how materials are designed. Uh, that are more and more uh, often based on computation and theory. In fact, it happens nowadays uh, regularly that uh, materials are first discovered based on, on theory and computation and only afterwards uh, they are synthesized and characterized also experimentally. And here I'm bringing uh, up the, the, the materials genome initiative that boosted the, the sort of uh, approach to materials uh, discovery. And this is really also beyond uh, beyond the condensed matter. I mean, nowadays the, the, the approximations to DFT are really used regularly to, for example, discover catalysts or even drugs. So, what we would like to do is to extend this uh, materials by design paradigm to correlated materials. So, this requires computational speed. And just another little point: this is not just something restricted to the United States; it's worldwide spread phenomenon. Uh, this is just another example from Europe where there have been uh, uh, just this year dramatic increase in funding for uh, projects that prioritize research that can benefit society, for example, for climate. Uh, and so the, the, there can be a great uh, impact uh, of this field in, into, in, into applications uh, useful for society uh, that uh, is still uh, unexplored largely. Uh, so. OK, so uh, the outline of this lecture, uh, first of all, um, uh, I will introduce the GA method. And I will do that uh, starting from, uh, a, uh, from the formulation for genetic multi-orbital uh, models. So I will start from models. And here I will introduce this quantum embedding formulation that I mentioned in the beginning and that, that I will clarify later uh, what it means exactly and why it's useful. Then I will uh, just outline the interface DFT. You have heard yesterday, for example, that about the MFT it can be interfaced to DFT or to, to GW. So here I will focus on the interface to DFT. And uh, Yongxin will tell you more in the tutorials about it. Then uh, I will also mention something about how, can extract, how one can extract from uh, these formalism spectral properties, so mass normalization effects and so on. Um, and finally, uh, in the last part, I will talk about this recent extension, this goes GA in particular, because, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this can really cure uh, these this, uh, this, uh, limitations that we have currently identified, it appears, uh, while maintaining an advantage computationally compared to the MFT. So that's, uh, that's something that also is relevant. And it's based on exactly the same formalism that we are going to learn. So uh, it's, it's some, somehow a way of uh, getting both uh, with a single lecture. So let's start from this the introduction for uh, model um, uh, systems. We're going to focus on uh, models that look like this. So uh, I will need to break down this equation in, in, uh, in manageable pieces and explain what these symbols mean. Uh, so that we can make progress and uh, set the notations uh, that are going to be, to be using throughout the lecture uh, once and for all. So um, this uh, um, there is a term, first term that is one body term. Yeah, you can imagine this is some sort of matrix that come out from uh, a conscious Hamiltonian, for example. And these are of course fermionic uh, operators, creation annihilation operators. 
we have uh, this label R that denotes the unit cell of the system. If you have a lattice, we have some unit cell repeated periodically. And so here we have it, the Fourier conjugate part of it, that is the crystal momentum. Um, then we classify the fermionic degrees of freedom uh, using these labels, I or J, and then alpha or beta. And I will use this convention that when I or J is equal to zero, that corresponding mode is what we call uncorrelated. And uncorrelated here just means that it's a mode that appears only in this first one body term of the Hamiltonian, but not in this term that instead can contain interaction. So for I or J equal to zero, uh, there will be only a one body part. And for the other uh, groups of degrees of freedom where I or J are bigger or equal than one, then we refer to correlated degrees of freedom, typically open shells of, of uh, D or F electrons. And note that this is not the most general possible interaction. It is a local kind of interaction. So each one of these terms here is the most general operator you can think of that you can build with creation equation operators with labels R and I. But there is no mixing between, let's say, R, I, and R prime, I prime. And so it, this is an assumption we are making uh, at the moment. So this is like in a Hubbard model as opposed to extended Hubbard model, for example. OK, so now that the notation is fixed, of course, please ask me questions uh, along the way if you have. Um, now, <clears throat> I mentioned that this GA method is a variational method. And uh, so we need to define the variational space. So we call Psi G the most general GA wave function that we're going to have. And it's represented in this form, where Psi naught is some single particle wave function. And P is some operator that we assume to have a local form. So it's again some sort of uh, operator that can be constructed with modes labeled by R and I. Uh, and it's a product of them. Uh, we only assume to have uh, this product over the correlated degrees of freedom. And that's because physically we want to modify the weights of the different electronic configurations of psi naught. Uh, especially for the modes that are correlated when we have some interaction. So this is a variational choice. And you can think graphically about this variational form as something that picks a single particle wave function from some sort of set of, uh, uh, of single particle wave functions. And if we had only that, this method would be hard to fuck if you, you can think. And then this operator P takes a, a wave function here and maps it into our physical space. And this is, can be also mathematically represented in some, in some basis uh, as written down here, where this is some generic uh, Fox state, uh, local Fox state, like a multiplet living in this set. And this one is a generic local Fox state living inside this other set, okay? Uh, so in principle, there is no reason to think about two different sets. This will just set the stage for the generalization I mentioned later. Uh, you can, if you want to prefer, if you prefer, think that this multiplets live all in the same space, but with no loss of generality, I can imagine that, uh, uh, that this psi not lives in you know, the copy of our space, and this P just maps this space into our physical space. Not useful now, but it will become useful later. Uh, one observation, uh, this matrix is very big. Why? Because these are multiplets, so they're, the dimension, the number of these multiplets grows exponentially with the number of modes. If the number of modes is nu i, uh, we have two to the power of nu i modes uh, here, so in the Fox states. So these are the occupation numbers that you can think of as the digits of a number running from zero to two to the power of nu i minus one, minus one because we start from zero. So these occupation numbers are zero or one. So we have uh, all these, these possible combinations. This means that this matrix is extremely big. So you can imagine that, for example, if I corresponds to a D open shells, this uh, dimension is to the power of 10 rows and columns. So, and then what we need to do is to minimize the variational energy, first evaluate it, and then also minimize this variational energy not only with respect to the most general single particle wave functions, but also with respect to all of these parameters that in general can also be complex. And there can be simplifications in some cases due to symmetries, but in general, 
you can understand that this is a fairly complicated problem. So the formalism that we're going to use for breaking this down into a manageable uh, into a manageable algorithm is based on these two references that I also gave in the uh, beginning uh, in the first very first slide. And as I mentioned, this is difficult, especially because these matrices are very very large. So how are we going to uh, uh, reduce the problem to something manageable? We are going to reduce it to a, some sort of quantum embedding method. So something that looks very much like uh, the MFT and as well as other quantum embedding methods like uh, density matrix embedding theory, uh, if you are, are familiar with that. Um, so what is the sort of algorithmic structure? Uh, we uh, consider our genetic system as composed by fragments, right? So this, each one of this I block can be considered as a subsystem of our original lattice. And the idea is very much like the MFT that each one of these fragments can be uh, uh, considered as embedded uh, into some auxiliary bath, like in some sort of impurity model like this, where uh, the bath decrease of freedom and the coupling of this bath with impurity um, has to be determined itself consistently in such a way that after convergence, it mm, represents uh, uh, and approximate the interaction between the fragment and its environment in the actual system, very much like the MFT. And before to explain how this is even possible, let's just show that this makes some sense because we know that when we reformulate the problem uh, in another way, the complexity does not disappear. It can only be moved from a place to another. And this can be extremely useful and, and it is many, very useful in this case, but it's, it's important to appreciate that the complexity is moved but not disappears. And, and the observation I want to make is that the number of independent parameters of this lambda matrix is this one. But this is exactly the dimension of this system because this fragment is of dimension two to the new i. And within the GA, the bath has exactly the same size of the impurity. So this is like a tensor product of two systems of this size. So the dimension is exactly equal to the number of independent lambda parameters. So this is exactly why this still makes sense. And it makes sense that we can go there. And another remark, this is a good point to understand why this is so much less computationally demanding than the MFT, two key reasons. First of all, we only need to calculate the ground state of this uh, impurity model not the entire um, uh, spectra. We don't need the self energy. Second, it, it is that uh, uh, this bath is small. So this is a finite system. It's not infinite as in the NFT. So you can imagine that one can easily capitalize on this and, and then gain uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, speed uh, because capitalizing on this lower computational complexity. Another one slide I, I will show about uh, this machine learning idea. This is not yet, uh, it's, it's not something you're going to use this afternoon, but it's actually implemented in that code for some specific uh, case. What one can do is to capitalize on the universality of this sort of structure, this embedding system, and use machine learning for speeding up the process. So you can tr train a machine before to make any calculations that perform this but computational bottleneck operation for free. And when this is possible, uh, basically the computational cost of this method becomes really comparable to bare, to bare approximations to DFT. So I will not say more about this, but I leave you the reference in case you are interested. And uh, this is like the, a, 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 new, a new line of research that is still uh, ongoing. Okay, so, now let's go into the technical part. Uh, for clarity reasons, I decided to break it down into five uh, subsections. What I would like to do is to take your questions at the end of each one of these subsection. And I will try to make a little summary at the end of each uh, one of these. Uh, so that even if in, in case you lose track of some technical detail, you can still uh, keep track of what is the main, uh, the main uh, uh, thing going on and you can still follow everything. 
So the first part is about defining a, a number of approximations we are going to do to make progress at the semi-analytical level with the formalism. Um, the second part is going to be about how we can make use of these simplifications or approximations for evaluating the variational energy in terms of our variational parameters. And uh, keep in mind that this is generally a very difficult problem. In fact, if we, if we don't do any approximation, these can be done, uh, but it requires like Monte Carlo. So there is a variation scheme called, called variational Monte Carlo, where this is exactly what this is done. But thanks to some simplifications, we can really carry out this, uh, this calculation in a much more manageable way and have some sort of closed form for what the energy looks like. Then we will make two key changes of variable. The first one is the definition of these labels and amplitudes. And mathematically, this will look like a change of variables, but this is very important physically because it relates, is the key step that relates the GA with the rotational invariant Slay boson uh, theory. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's very important also for, for that reason, but also will uh, be useful for setting up our computational framework uh, in an eff efficient way. And the second change of variable uh, will course, we, we will introduce the so-called embedding states. So these states belonging to this auxiliary impurity model that we introduced before. And this is also a mathematical step, but also that carries a lot of physical meaning because it will be the step that will make, allow us to make connection to quantum embedding schemes. And so to look at this method from a unified perspective together with the dynamic mean field theory and uh, um, density matrix embedding theory and other quantum embedding methods uh, uh, out there. The final step is the definition of a Lagrange function. So how we set up this optimization problem that schematically was here represented by this arrow. Of course, there is some detail to add here. Okay, so let's start from the definition of the main approximations we're going to make. Since this part is well established and pretty much known since the 60s, I will uh, not go into too much details here. Uh, we will do two key approximations. One is called Gasviller approximation. And the only thing I will mention about this is that this is an approximation in finite dimension, but in the limit of infinite coordination lattices, this would be no longer an approximation, so it's exact. And this is an important remark because it it essentially give us a way of thinking about the relation between the GA and the MFT. We can think of the GA as a variational approximation to the MFT because of this reason, in the sense that where the MFT is exact, infinite dimensional systems, the GA is a variational approximation. So give us an upper bound to the energy and an estimate of all ground state properties based on operational principle. The other approximation is mathematically written down here. It's called Gasvilla constraints. And uh, from the GA perspective, this is really something that we assume because uh, of uh, some mathematical um, simplifications that we get out, out of it that I'm going to explain. I just want to point out that from the rotational invariance lay boson theory, the, the, the physical meaning of these equations, it becomes a little bit more apparent. Of course, I cannot explain both in a single lecture because that's, there's really enough material here. But I want to point out that if you revisit the same equations that we're going to obtain from the rotational invariance of the boson perspective, then these two equations acquire a physical meaning uh, as well that can help uh, for guiding us in, in, making, uh, in making sense of, uh, of why we do what. But right now we choose this constraint for a reason that can be still uh, explained mathematically. And what we are going to use for the next uh, uh, 10, 20 minutes is Vick theorem and these two approximations. And let me be clear about what I mean here with Vick theorem. It's not the same Vick theorem that you use in field theory. It has nothing to do with Gaussian integrals. It's just a simple version of Vick theorem that you use when you do hartree fock for example. So if you have a single particle by functions and you want the expectation value of some many body operator, uh, here it's with four creation equation operators, but it could be even more. All you need to do is to draw uh, contraction lines, yeah? 
and you write a term corresponding to each line. So for example, these two types of contractions correspond to these two terms, and these two contractions correspond to the second term. And you need to keep track of a sign, this minus sign here, that you can get as the parity of the number of times you get a crossing between these lines. So this is the combinatorics one gate in the end. So it's not surprising that you're going to need this because basically we are dealing with a wave function that is constructed using also a single particle wave function. So what these Gazvilla constraints and this Gazvilla approximation are going to do at the end of the day is to kill some of these contractions, making the combinatorics manageable. So this is the key, the key, the key point. And now we can go a little bit more into details, uh, for example, uh, to explain the, the, the consequence of these constraints and how this can kill some of these big, big contractions. Um, as, and to understand the meaning of these constraints, it is insightful to look at this particular object here. So we inspect this object. And let's imagine that we evaluate it using the theorem then we have two possible ways of piling up, of making contractions. One is when we contract this with this, and then we will have, we will have a lot of self-contractions from within this P dagger P block. And this would give this to stir. But then we can have also a leg coming from here to this block and from here to this block and all possible different combinations of that. This would give some additional contribution that is represented here with this subscript two legs. But now we can try to see how this would be simplified if we could assume this constraint. So the first observation is that we have this thing here that is one and this appears here. So we can kill it and this we can set it to one. But then once we have this eliminated, we can also simplify these two terms because we assume them to be equal. And so we get this equation now. So if we have two legs coming out from a P dagger P block, that does not contribute. And by mm, posing and pondering, you would be evil, easily able to, we cannot do it now, but you can easily convince yourself that if this is true, then it's true also for non-local kind of terms like this, where we have R hat I here and R prime J here. So basically this gives us a mathematical intuition about why these particular constraints are helpful, we should keep in mind that they slightly reduce the variation of freedom, uh, no? but, uh, but they give the simplification that kill a lot of these contraction legs. And basically the Gasville approximation kill even more of this kind of contractions. And we are going to show later uh, how this can help. So uh, this is the end of this very first uh, uh, piece. And uh, I don't know if there are any questions at this stage already. Probably not, but uh, if there are, maybe please let me know. Is there any question? Uh, Nicola, there are two questions. Um, uh, maybe I can see here. So what channel. is the meaning of the brackets? Uh, which slide? I don't know, but okay, let me go back and then we we'll see. And could you comment on the physics of the Gazvilla constraints and its consequences? Yeah. Uh, just the previous one. Okay, so uh, um, this one is this bracket here. Uh, if this is the one, it's just to help the eyes. So to identify this graphically, this P dagger P block as a single unit, uh, out of which can you can imagine that two legs come out or zero leg come out. This was the only reason why I put this bracket. So there is no, you could remove them. It's just a statical choice. And uh, what is the physics of the Gasvilla constraints and its consequences? Yeah, thanks. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, the, here, the, 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 within the GA, the, the, the meaning of these constraints is physically not obvious. Uh, and yeah, the, the reason is actually this, why we choose that. Uh, uh, from the residual invariance labels and perspective, that's some sort of gauge theory. Yeah, and, uh, and then you have an extended Hilbert space and the role of these constraints would be something where that identifies the physical space after that we have uh, uh, an original theory formulated in a larger space. And, and there it's a little bit more understandable also physically why that's needed uh, thing to do. 
But uh, from the GA perspective, you can only go to the bottom of the formalism and identify consequences about uh, that you can uh, of, of, the, of these constraints uh, that uh, and, and then try to post process and have a lot of uh, a posteriori arguments about why uh, all of these make sense. But I think if you want some physical intuition about this, you need to uh, revisit this on, on from the from the rotation invariance lay boson perspective. And this is really a situation that happens quite often and very much here that certain aspects are easy to understand from the GA perspective and others from the rotation invariance lay boson perspective. And it's beneficial to to think about uh, to know both of them ideally to really have a full picture. Are there any others? No, I think no, right? Function? No, there is nothing. That's all. Yeah. I hope I answered the question. Uh, the uh, I see. Do we get which perspective from the references you mentioned? In the references I mentioned, the rotation, it's always mentioned that this is equivalent to the rotation invariance lay boson. And actually, uh, uh, this paper is formulated in terms of the rotation invariance lay boson. So this is formulated in terms of the GA, and this is formulated in terms of the rotational invariance lay boson. So yes. And in fact, this was the, yeah, this is a paper where the operatorial formulation of this rotational invariance lay boson theory was, was derived. Uh, so yeah, it's really about lay boson. So yes, it was, it's there. Perfect. Okay, let's continue now. We define these two approximations, and now we want to use them for evaluating the total energy. Um, sorry. Uh, and before to do that, uh, let's make a little remark. It's a little change of notation we are going to do. So uh, in the Hamiltonian that we have derived before, here we could have also local terms. So we could have this being non-zero. So we choose to set it as zero, but with no loss of generality. What this means is that if there is some local term that would make this non-zero, we simply move it and incorporate it within the definition of this H local. So what this means is that now this H local can contain and contains interactions, but also can contain one body terms. So this is just a little detail. I pointed out because what this means is that now, if you want to take the expectation value of H, we need to calculate the expectation value of two key objects. One, the expectation value of non-local one-body operators, and two, local operators that can be one-body, two-body, and body. It doesn't matter. So these are the key objects that we need to uh, deal with. So we need to break this down into two parts. Part one, how to get take the expectation value of terms like this and part two uh, terms like this. And let's start from the local operators. And this will be already sufficient for understanding why this is such a complicated problem if we don't do any approximation. So this is the full wave function and it has the P operator in front, right? So imagine, okay, we, we, if we move the P operators here, we feel, here we put the dagger of course, because it comes from the bra, right? and we want to use big theorem now, this is extremely complex because this P contains all components, including those at R prime, I prime, different from R and I's that are the operators that we are assuming here to be uh, used for building this operator O. So, uh, and of course this with R prime, uh, I prime can pass through, they can commute over, but this doesn't really simplify things the combinatorics of this term is horrible because the number of these contractions grows very, very fast and becomes hard to manage very quickly. So here is where all of our calculations, uh, uh, simplifications can come uh, handy. And let's imagine to evaluate this using the theorem by start, starting by classifying connected and disconnected terms as we did before. So let's look at the disconnected term. The disconnected term it means that we only consider contractions where this block, again, the, this is just for helping the eye. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, these objects here are self-contracted with each other, right? 
And these blocks are contracted with each other again. If you put all of these together, this just gives the product of these two different expectation values. So the disconnected terms would be just this one. But now what can be shown, uh, and this I don't go in detail because yeah, but uh, it can be shown by using those two simplifications, this actually be, can be set to one. And this has to do with the fact that, yeah, if you have big contractions popping out from these Pidagger P blocks, you can show that they, they, they don't get contribution. So this is the key idea. And so you can remove it. And once you remove it, you have this gigantic simplification, at least for the disconnected terms, that all the components of the P operators with different degrees of freedom are prime I prime from the operator O that we are looking at don't contribute. So this simplifies a lot the formula is we don't have as many big contractions if you want. But what about the connected terms? Now connected means that there can be some lines going from here to here. Well, also this can be shown that it vanishes. So this is a huge simplification now because we have reduced everything to this result where basically all of the components of P that are not R or an I, they're gone, okay. And one can show that the same thing can be done for the non-local one body operator. So things like this. Uh, all of the components of the P that are, are not involved into this operator don't contribute. And one can also make another step that simplifies further the situation. Uh, again, based on these approximations, that is just about repeating applications of Vic theorem and not, nothing deeper than that. Uh, one can show that basically we can replace these blocks with some linear combination of F dagger operators. So look at this. This is P dagger, C dagger, P. So this is, uh, C dagger is an operator, remember, that lives in the space of this uh, Psi G. So this is the correlated space. And this was the what notation we use for indicating the so-called, we, we, we are going to call them quasi-particle operators that, for reason that will be clear much later. But these are the operators that live in this space of the psi not wave function. Maybe I can scroll back to the beginning to make this, uh, to remind you this. So we use, we say we have this green space and this blue space and, and the, the modes in the green space are spanned by F. Yeah, and, and those in the blue space are spanned by, by C. Right? So I'm using the same consistent notation to do that. So uh, uh, we can replace this block with some linear combination of uh, these F operators uh, that where these coefficients can be calculated by um, from this equation by inverting these equations, where each term can be just is just a well-defined expression uh, in terms of the variational parameters we have. Uh, that are this P and, and the psi naught. Uh, and these are purely local. So these are somehow things that we are going to see are easier to, to evaluate than, uh, than, than these that would involve different non-local terms at the same time. So uh, just even though I want, I, I, I skip here the details about the derivation, I want to guide you in, into making sense of it, um, at least uh, heuristically so that you can digest this notion uh, a little bit better. So remember that DC live in the blue space, this F live in the green space. So if we have something in the green space, we apply the P, we move to the blue space, then we apply C dagger. This gives us something back in the blue space. And then we have P dagger that put, put us back to the green space. So this would be something from the green space to the green space through this second order process, right? Uh, so this could be any algebraic combination of F modes, but it turns out because of mathematics that it's just some linear combination with coefficients that can be calculated. Okay, so I hope that this helps a little bit to digest a little bit this notion and what is the reason why we have an F here and a C here. But okay, once we accept uh, all of these steps, and this is a summary slide of this subsection, we can evaluate our variational energy, and this is our equation. So what we need to minimize is this energy function that depends on psi naught and depends on P. Uh, 
in uh, through all of these definitions, this term and also the fact that it appears in the definition of R over here. And uh, note that this is purely local operator. Uh, this is purely local operator. And the remaining part is involving only psi naught is the expectation value of some uh, one body operator with respect to a single particle wave functions we're going to see is easy to evaluate as well. So this is uh, how we simplify dramatically the formalism. We only have to take expectation value of many body operators that are purely local or one body operators with respect to only a single particle wave function. So this is a huge simplification. We need to remember that we need to minimize the energy while fulfilling these constraints because we use these constraints for deriving the expression for the energy. And therefore, uh, uh, we need to minimize uh, this while fulfilling these constraints. So it's a constraint minimization problem. Um, okay, so this is the summary of the slide. So I can take questions about these uh, if there are, and otherwise I move on. There are questions? I don't think, right? I do not see any questions. Okay, we can wait uh, 15 seconds and then we move on. Okay, let's move on. If, if some question comes to mind, just write it and we can just go back. But right now we have evaluated our variation energy and now we need, we need to make these two change of variables. But as I explained, these change of variables are not mathematical only, they carry physical meaning. So it's important to, to, be, to be aware of these and, and follow how they, uh, they emerge from the GA perspective. And this is our variational energy expression again, uh, it's just a summary. And now I'm pointing out this thing that I mentioned before a little bit more explicitly in a graphical way by putting these rectangles around all of these terms that we need to evaluate. Just to point out that all of these things in the boxes are purely local. Local means that they involve only Ri everywhere. It's only Ri. There is never something like R R prime. Yeah. So this is why this is much easier. And you can think about all of these uh, degrees of freedom with only Ri modes as uh, somehow subsystems. You can think of them as subsystem with respect to the entire uh, system. No? And therefore, all of these expectation value can be ultimately expressed in terms of the so-called reduced density matrix of psi naught to this subsystem labeled by R and I. Remember the reduced density matrix is nothing else than what you get from psi naught by tracing out all degrees of freedom except those that involve modes R, I. So nothing mysterious. So if we, if we do that, we can rewrite all of these things in the boxes as listed here. And now these are traces where P0 is, some, is a representation of this density matrix, reduced density matrix, matrix of psi naught within the Ri space in, in a particular basis. And now uh, instead of P, we have the explicit matrix representation that was in terms of this coefficients lambda, if you remember what this equation that we already shown, have shown before. So this we, we, we can just verify this by inspection by plugging in this equation in here, we will immediately see that these identities are true. There is nothing fundamentally complex about this. It's just that, of course, there is no time here to make the algebra, but it's just algebra. Uh, notice that we also introduce these matrices, F, F dagger with a capital, and these are just matrix representation of creation and inflation operators in their own uh, fog basis. So this, you can think of these as matrices that, have, uh, that are fairly big, but they have very simple entries. Most of the entries are zero, and some are one or minus one. So this is how you write down, uh, you, uh, yeah, you represent in a fog basis the creation and relation operators. You may have done it if you have ever implemented an exact generalization code already. So, one, uh, um, okay, so this is the, the key, the, the, these are the key objects that we are going now to rewrite in a slightly different way. And we will introduce this matrix of labels and amplitudes. From the GA perspective, this is some sort of, uh, um, uh, like um, object that is built by different, but from variational parameters. So it is not a fundamental object, but is a derived object in terms of lambda and square root of P zero. 
Uh, notice that this is the square root of a matrix. So in case you have any doubts about what it means, a function of a matrix, let me know. But this is a standard notion, is uh, something that you can also look up on Wikipedia, I guess. Yeah. So, but let's imagine that we take this as a definition and we simply plug it into all of this expression. So now we see that all of these expressions depend both on lambda and p0. If we plug that in, one can verify that this simplify a lot and everything can be expressed exclusively in terms of this phi. Maybe you can make sense of it just for this particular case already without even writing anything, no? Because uh, if you imagine to plug this in, no? you break P0 into the square root of P0 and you square it and use cyclicity. So you can make sense of it for all of these terms in the same way as this one is just algebra again. But this is a key simplification. So the motivation of doing this substitution from the GA perspective is mathematical. But then when you compare the energy equation that I'm going to summarize in the end of this subsection with the one that you get from the boson, you can, they're explicitly the same then. Uh, so this is, this is a key point. So let's just take all of these terms and plug them back into our expression for the variational energy. And we get this simplified expression where we don't have any more lambda or P0 or psi naught. We have only these uh, matrices of slave boson amplitudes as we, as we have called. And we have them both in the energy, in the definition of R, and in these Gasville constraints. So we need to minimize now the energy with respect to psi naught, all of these matrices while respecting these constraints. So this completes this other third point. Uh, I see no questions. Well, I guess this was an easy piece. So I move on to the fourth piece, that is these embedding states. So the key equation that we are going to have to explain now is this one, and it uh, it, it's, uh, it looks a bit scary, so let, let's break it down in manageable pieces so that we can explain uh, it a little bit more easily. So I cover up some parts. I will explain them later. So if we just look at the part that is not covered in gray right now, uh, what does this represent? So we are picking, we are now defining a new system, auxiliary system that has an impurity degrees of freedom, impurity degrees of freedom. Uh, so it has no i degrees of freedom, exactly as our fragment of, uh, of system that um, for the label i. Uh, and the bath that has exactly the same size. And these are fox states spanning this. And notice that I put some hat here now. This hat is just to make sure that you don't get confused and realize that this system, we introduced it now for the first time. No, we, we didn't put it in the formula so far. Uh, so these are really different objects, the C dagger with a hat or without a hat or before. So it's just different, uh, different objects. So then what this thing here would represent if we put, if we ignore all these great things is it's just a generic state in this uh, tensor product space with coefficients that are given by this matrix of the boson amplitudes. So the mapping is here very, very clear. You can think if you know uh, a bit of, of uh, what, what, what it means purification. So you can think about the matrix as something with like an operator, not something with a cat and the bra, yeah? The idea of this is just that, of this transformation is that you can think to transform one of this bra back into a cat. So you have a tensor product of cat instead of cat times bra, yeah? So this is how one can get from a matrix to a state in a larger space. And this is, if you think about it, uh, this is exactly the same idea I used uh, in, in the so-called purification, purification of um, mixed states. So uh, you can always do this job and this has other consequences. Uh, if you don't know what this means, it's completely irrelevant. So it just, uh, if you can leverage on that, it may help. If not, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, now, so this piece of the mapping is kind of clear now. Uh, we can always do this, uh, whether it's helpful or not that we will see. Uh, now let's, Mm, put away the gray and explain also these other parts. So this is some sort of thing that look like a phase factor, but actually if you inspect it, you will notice that this is always either plus one or minus one. And this is a sign that basically depends non-trivially on the occupation of this n states over here, this Fox states n over here. Um, so this is the sum of all of the occupation numbers, yeah. 
And the reason for, for this is just that when we include it, this will give us some sign fermionic, some sign that come from exchanging fermionic operators, right? Now, and we, if we take this into account, we will be able to rewrite all of these this terms that before were written in terms of the matrix of the boson amplitudes uh, in terms of these five states, but with expression that are much simpler. So that's, that's the reason why this is introduced. It's mathematical, but it's guided by our physical intuition that we would like to formulate this problem as an embedding method where our impurity is just not some sort of uh, abstract object, but you can somehow use this, uh, this, uh, this method for capturing the main, the, 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 the key of the, the, the main physics of the interaction between this fragment and its environment. So it's a mathematical step guided by physical intuition. So th that somehow requires a little bit of, of details. And this is one of them. Why this particle hole? This, is, this UPH is a particle hole transformation that in particular would change the vacuum of these end states into the fully occupied states of these end states. This could be even avoided, but it has some nice, uh, it's aesthetically a good thing to do. And in particular, this is good for when one enforces symmetries. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about symmetries here, but I'm going to talk about one symmetry that is very important. If we look at the normal phase of the system, so we don't look at superconductivity, we want to enforce this condition. So we want our full wave function to be an eigenstate of the number operator, and this is true if psi naught is an eigenstate of the number operator, and if the p operators commute to the number as well, so then the number is conserved by the p operator. So it turns out that by if you substitute uh, the 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 this level was an amp so you, if you if you just substitute uh, the definition of phi with respect to all the parameters that we have defined so far, no? it turns out that this condition that is a symmetry condition corresponds to the condition that this embedding system is half filled. So the number of total particles in the impurity, the C, and in the bath, this F, is nu i. The total number of modes that this system could host is two times nu i, because there is nu i modes here and two here. So this is half filled instead. So this is a reason this condition would look a little bit more ugly if we didn't include this particle hole transformation. But once we do that, this is what one can check. So we can substitute these traces with some expectation value of very simple operators uh, with respect to this phi. So in particular, this operator is involving a, a, a one body operator in the bath. That is the object we call delta along the way. No? This other term where notice the, the order of phi and phi dagger is reversed. Instead, it corresponds to an expectation value respect to this phi of something constructed with the C operator. So it's an impurity. And this other term that contains phi dagger F phi F. So the phi and uh, dagger and F are not attached, correspond to some hybridization between these two. So this looks exactly like the terms that appear in an impurity model. Yeah, we have a bath an impurity that can have an interaction and some hybridization between them. So once we make this last substitution, we obtain this variational energy. And uh, this variational energy now, it depends only on psi naught and this phi. Of course, there is a phi for each I label. And these are like reference systems we, are, we have built for the sake of, uh, yeah building this uh, quantum embedding formulation of the method. And, and again, also these gas villain constraints can be expressed in terms of the phi uh, states, and we need to minimize the energy while fulfilling these constraints. Very good. So this completes our fourth step. Maybe I give again 15 seconds for uh, possible questions. I see nothing. I don't know if it's because Youngshin, can you confirm there is no question? Uh, no question. Very good. OK, so the last step is this Lagrange formulation. And that will be the end of this very formal part. Um, but it's very important still because that's the final step to reach this, uh, this, this sort of algorithmic structure that we outlined in the beginning. Lagrange formulation of the optimization problem. So 
the point is that we have this energy to minimize while fulfilling all of these constraints. So it's a constraint minimization problem. And when we have constraints, we use Lagrange multiplier theorem. So that's why we end up with some Lagrange function. And these are the Lagrange multipliers we are going to introduce. Now, some of them are uh, very simple and easy to digest. Others uh, uh, are, are used for some rather subtle but extremely useful trick uh, that result in linearizing the problem with respect to these phi states. So let's start one by one. So this is a normalization condition. We will introduce uh, a Lagrange multiplier E for enforcing that. We will also introduce a Lagrange multiplier called EC i for the normalization condition of each one. Uh, what does it mean these participants can now see my screen? Uh, is, is there any technical problem? I, I do not see. Uh, OK, now I got some sort of. Uh, OK, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so this this is this was our first Casvilla constraint. And now it's, uh, it's enforced using some Belgrade multiplier called ECI. Uh, this is also one of the gas Villard constraints, is the second gas Villard constraint where delta was defined in this way. But now we're going to do something a little bit subtle. So we are going to promote delta to an independent variable and by introducing a Lagrange multiplier called lambda i that enforces the definition of delta. So first we pretend that delta is a new variable, and then we add Lagrange multipliers to say, oh, there is a constraint, delta is actually equal to this. And you may wonder, why do you want to do that to yourself? No, this is very useful instead because it's going to help us to linearize the problem with respect to this phi that at the moment appear here, where that's a linear term, if you want. But then they also appear in this expression for r, and r appears both here and here. So as a function of phi, this is uh, highly nonlinear. So that's a problem. So by using this trick, uh, we, we can linearize the problem. And we're going to do this twice. We're even going to do this for, for delta. We are going also to use it for R. So we're going to introduce another set of Lagrange multipliers called D that enforce the definition of R that now is promoted to an independent variable. So this may require a little bit of pause and ponder that we cannot do on the fly. Of course, I can answer questions. Uh, uh, I, can answer, uh, I can answer the question if there are, but this is the key idea. We want really to enforce the definition of this R so that we can linearize the problem. And now I will just tell you how uh, uh, the Lagrange function looks like at the end after we collect the terms in a convenient way. So there will be three lines now. The first one involves something called quasi-particle Hamiltonian that depends parametrically on R and lambda. And this is a one-body Hamiltonian. Uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, series of terms, one for each correlated set of degrees of freedom i. And this involves this embedding Hamiltonian. This is a collection of all terms involving the phi states. And this has the form of the impurity model that we uh, introduced before. Uh, this is where the, the impurity and the bath has exactly the same size and they're hybridized to a, a one body term that depends on these parameters now. And then there is this other line that contains all of these Lagrange multipliers that we have introduced. But you can Im immediately see that uh, if we want to take subtle point equations of these, when we want the subtle point respect to psi naught, we will need that psi naught is uh, in a, um, an eigenstate or the ground state of this quasi-particle Hamiltonian. And similarly, this phi is going to be an eigenstate or the ground state of this embedding Hamiltonian. So the Lagrange equations, uh, when we enforce the subtle point with respect to this psi naught and phi, they have a very clear meaning. And then there are other details, of course, because we introduce all other Lagrange multipliers. But the important thing is that we can write them down and there is nothing complicated about it except, uh, except algebra. And if we do it, we get a, a list of Lagrange equations, each one obtained by taking partial derivatives of the Lagrange function um, with respect to uh, all of its entries and setting them to zero because we look for a subtle point. 
And, and this is how the algorithmic structure that we introduced before emerges. So this is exactly how things are implemented in the code that you're going to use in the tutorial. So the code will uh, start uh, by guessing some parameters R and lambda. We are going to see later that these parameters R and lambda encode the information about uh, the Gasville approximation to the self-energy. So they carry some physical meaning that can help with the guesses that we can make. But after a certain guess, we can use that and the first Lagrange equation for deducing the delta consistent with this R and lambda. And we can proceed sequentially and deduce D, uh, these coefficients that are one-to-one -one correspondence with the lambda sigma matrix that we introduced before, some Lagrange multiplier. And these allow us to define the embedding Hamiltonian. And then we need to calculate the ground state or in, uh, yeah, the ground state of this embedding Hamiltonian. This is the operation. Of, uh, of the, here the explain, I mean, um, uh, outline in this, in this scheme uh, in, in this way below the arrow, yeah. And then we need to enforce two additional condition that will tell us whether the R and lambda that we tried were right or not. And if they are not, we simply need to go iteratively uh, through some using some algorithm, which could be a quasi Newton method or something like that for solving numerically this equation uh, so finding the R and lambda such that these two objects are actually self-consistent, so they are actually equal to zero, as the Lagrange equations uh, uh, want. So this is how we got from this variation of principle to this Lagrange formulation, uh, uh, and from, from this embedding formulation, that now help us also um, in terms of physical intuition, because the meaning of uh, this bath is now clear, no? it, somehow represents the, the interaction with the environment in our system of interest. So that's, that's really important. So we completed all of these necessary steps. And now uh, what we want to do is to move to the DFT plus GA interface here. We'll be a little bit uh, uh, um, just a high level uh, introduction. Uh, I don't know if there are questions, but if there aren't, it may be beneficial to pause a bit, uh, to take a little break. I don't know. Does it sound like a good idea or we can just move on? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, there are questions. Okay, I, I, yeah, maybe first we, we, uh, we answer questions mm -hmm. and then uh, we can, uh, we can, uh, uh, all right, so. Uh, what is the augmented Lagrange method? Uh, Lagrangian method? I don't really know. I think it's the vanilla Lagrangian method. So it's Lagrange function, uh, Lagrange multiplier theorem. As simple as that. Like the one that you use when you have a constraint and then you introduce a Lagrange multiplier. I don't, sorry for the ignorance. I don't know what you mean with the augmented Lagrangian method. It's just the bare Lagrange uh, multiplier theorem. Does it uh, answer you? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it answered, okay, perfect. All right, so if, if you uh, agree, we can take a, like a five minutes, something like that, pause, and maybe we can start back at five, uh, 10 uh, or five. Yeah, something like five, this. Ten. Five, five, 10, uh, five, maybe 15 now, five, 15 so that uh, you have a bit of time to recover and, uh, and then we will take it from there. All right, so welcome back. Um, okay, so what I will do now is to outline really the basic uh, algorithmic structure of EFT plus GA. And this is really something you will see in much more detail uh, later and you will uh, really deal with it in the tutorial. But still, uh, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction from uh, a perspective that, um, I find it useful. Uh, and then uh, we only have this uh, smaller uh, subsection. So the DFT plus GA agreement structure. Here we will follow uh, this um, reference, but uh, there are details that are elsewhere and Yongxin will um, probably say more. Um, and I would like to start by summarizing uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, a perspective that is suitable for generalization, uh, in my view. Uh, the conscience scheme that you already uh, all know. 
So what is the constant scheme in, in one slide? So we have some energy uh, function of the density, functional of the density. It has this, this three terms, roughly speaking. There is a kinetic approximation, that is the constant approximation. Uh, there is the hard three plus exchange plus correlation that I put all together in a single term. This is highly nonlinear function of the density. And then we have this term that depends in an explicit way on the density and the external potential, the, so the ionic potential within the Bonham approximation. So this is kind of the reason why the density is such a special observable, right? Because this external potential is the only non-universal part uh, of the Hamiltonian. And this is why uh, it's a special observable. So what is this kinetic component? So this is something that is evaluated within the Consham scheme, leveraging on the idea of reference system that you have heard a lot already. So what's the idea of reference system? So this is like a defined this density uh, to, through a two-step minimization, if you want. So uh, we take for a given density the best single particle wave function, so that's the reference system uh, uh, that uh, minimizes this uh, approximation to the kinetic energy. If you know uh, the levy lib formulation of DFT, you can recognize that this looks a little bit like the levy lib. Uh, functional, but there is no interaction, yeah. Okay, so say that what one can do to minimize this energy functional is to undo this two-step uh, minimization and formulate everything as a minimization respect to psi naught, but there is the problem that this is a highly nonlinear uh, uh, functional, kind of like in Hartley Fock that you end up with some nonlinear functional, right? So what you do then, uh, what you can, this is a way of thinking about it, is that you can introduce a Lagrange function where you promote the density that initially is a function of psi naught, this auxiliary system that we use. Uh, you promote it to an independent variable by introducing a Lagrange multiplier that we can call J. So the advantage of it is that now wherever we have this row expressed in terms of psi naught, we can substitute it with the density and so we linearize the problem with respect to psi naught. And when we do that, we can write down, rewrite the, the Lagrange function in this way, where now we have an expectation value with respect to psi naught of some, something we call conjugate Hamiltonian that contains a kinetic term, the external potential, and some external, uh, 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 some, some additional contribution that is uh, accounting for the fact that the, the, the electrons, physically speaking, propagate across across the lattice through a renormalized effective potential so that it, you need some some external uh, term to take into account but then the problem is still nonlinear but the nonlinearity is all in the density so you need to solve a self consistent find a self consistent density and this is done through the well known and celebrated self consistent charge self consistency cycle and this is something that is just a summary essentially uh, and at each iteration, you, you need to solve this Consham uh, uh, Hamiltonian and get the density, the corresponding density out of it until the density and the energy converge accor according to some criterion. So what does it change when we add correlations within this code? Basically what we do uh, uh, from a high level perspective is that instead of having a purely uncorrelated reference system here, we add a bit of the correlation. So this is not, the full interaction, it contains some interaction terms. And you notice that I wrote this already in a sense in second quantization. You can always go to second quantization, but this is important that I write it down in second quantization and there are this label I, and this is uh, related to the point that you heard over and over in the school in the previous days, that definition of this generalization or modification to the to the to, to the FT requires uh, the definition of a projection. So we need to define our correlated degrees of freedom in some way. And this can be done in different ways. And Yongxing will say something about it. You can have Vanier functions or projection methods. Uh, you, you have different choices. But this is exactly the same problem you have in the FT plus the MFT, right? And not and, and the other the other the other theories that you heard about. Uh, in the past few days. So let's assume that we have defined it. This is not the full interaction, but some sort of screened interaction that depends uh, typically on some parameters such as the Hubbard interaction strengths and the Hunt's 
Kuhn's uh, coupling constant J. And there can be a different U and J for a different uh, set of degrees of freedom. And so let's say UI and, and JI. Now, this is no longer an, a non-interacting system. So we don't want to describe it using uh, a single particle wave function. We will use the Gasviller wave function instead. So we will minimize it respect to the Gasviller wave function. This is what we want to do. And, but still, this is not the full interaction. Uh, so this means that we still need some exchange correlation, but it's not going to be the full exchange correlation uh, because now we don't want to count twice this, this term. So this is about the so-called double counting term that we need to take into account. So we add essentially these two terms, and now we can still undo this two-step minimization and formulate everything as a function of a minimization with respect to psi g. But this is again a non-linear problem with respect to psi g because uh, we have this hard exchange correlation that depends on the density to psi g in a highly non-linear way, and often this double counting is also non-linear. So it's kind of like the consham situation where we have a psi naught in the consham, but we have psi g here. But we can use exactly the same trick more or less to promote density to an independent variable using some Lagrange multiplier. It's a continual Lagrange multiplier, but it's, it's a still Lagrange multiplier. And we introduce this VDC that are this called double counting potential. Uh, that uh, uh, are instead used for, used for enforcing the definition of the occupation of the correlated degrees of freedom. So then we can promote these and these two independent variables and linearize the problem with respect to psi g. So we can do that. We will get uh, some scheme that in the end looks exactly like the constant scheme. But we also have this double counting potential in general. So this uh, will result in equations that Yangshin will show. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to calculate recursively the ground state of some constant Hubbard Hamiltonian that is of the form that we have discussed in the whole first part of the lecture. So if you just rewrite this in second quantization, that's the Hamiltonian that we have introduced before. Uh, but and, and, and this can be this self consistency equation can be solved in different ways. One way that I put here in this scheme could be this one. But first, you fix this double counting potentials, then you make some self self consistency, charge self consistency at fixed potential. And then afterwards, you calculate the self consistent potential. Uh, and, and this is some equation that characterizes the self consistent potential, depending on the Lagrange function that we have introduced in the previous slide. So, this is basically what this is all about. The physical idea is very simple. We just want to add some interaction in our reference system to make it more realistic, but we need to subtract some double counting. This makes our reference system more complicated. And we, we need to solve this Hamiltonian in, in some approximation. We use the Gasviller approximation, but we could use the MFT, and then this would be DFT plus DMFT, for example. So this is again a very high level. You will learn more about it a bit later. Uh, now I want to say a few words about spectral properties. So I talk only about how you get the ground state. So here I refer to this, uh, this is a standard reference for, for where this was explained, I think in the first time, uh, from the GA perspective. So the Gasviller-Landau quasi-particle. So what's the idea? So we had that Lagrange function before that allow us to determine the parameters encoding information about what P is, but also what psi naught is, right? And psi naught was the ground state of this quasi-particle Hamiltonian that was calculated the car city. but if you just stare at the, at the Lagrange function for a bit, you can realize that yeah, at least in the thermodynamic limit. Also, if you add an electron, for example, uh, to the quasi-particle Hamiltonian, this would be an eigen mode of the quasi-particle Hamiltonian. So you excite some electron there, and afterwards you apply the P, that still corresponds to uh, a subtle point of the Lagrange function. But that will have a higher energy, and so it represents an excited state. So this means that we can have access to subtle points of Lagrange functions that we can interpret as approximations to excited states. And the idea that uh, is applied here and in basically many, many references afterwards, including those that I mentioned in the beginning, what one can do is to try to insert in the definition of the spectral function that here is given at zero temperature, you can insert a basis of this sort of excitation, single particle excitations because this is nothing else than ultimately the density of states for adding or removing an electron. So we can add excitations of this kind. Uh, and if we do that and manipulate this expression in a similar way as we did for when we evaluated the ground state energy, 
one can show that the Green's function corresponding to this special function looks like this. So using the Dyson equation, we get some self energy. And the self energy uh, turns out to have this form. First of all, it's local, momentum independent. That's exactly like the MFT. Uh, this is not surprising because yeah, uh, I remind you, we use essentially the DMFT hypothesis in a certain way at the beginning, right? Because we made this Gasviller approximation that is exact only in infinite dimensions. So it makes a lot of sense that in the end we get a self energy that is local. And of course, it's only existing in the correlated degrees of freedom. So this is the biggest block, fortunately, and there is no self energy. And here there is for each other block. But you can see that this self energy is, has a linear form. So it's somehow simpler than how it can be in the MFT. It cannot capture the existence of poles in particular. And poles in the self energy are essentially why mod physics uh, can emerge. This still can capture the fact that the quasi particle weight that is encoded in this R dagger R matrix can uh, vanish. This totally uh, is captured. Um, but uh, the, the, the Hubbard bands, to, to get those, you would need these singularities in the self energy that we cannot get in the basic uh, GA. And now, as a final topic, I will say something about this recent formalism extension that goes to the ghost GA. This is based on these publications of 2017, and this has been revisited and pointed out and uh, enriched by other uh, physical and mathematical insights in this, in this recent work. Uh, and this is a more accurate extension of the, the, the GA method that it seems really to be basically uh, accurate as much as the MFT at the lower cost. So it's a very nice and interesting thing. And as I'm going to show you, the formalism is essentially the same that you have learned today. So you basically learn two methods in a single lecture, hopefully. Okay, so what is the key idea? Uh, before we had this wave function here and we, uh, we had to pick some psi naught single particle wave function from some set and, and map it into the physical space. But we have chosen to have this space to be of the same dimension as this. In fact, that's why I say that if we do like this, there is no reason to think about two spaces, right? Uh, you can just use the same space and have P be a map from the Hilbert space of the problem to itself. We just pick this perspective because now, because now it, it is a little bit more evident that one can do the following. One can enlarge this space and make this map P from the unphysical space or auxiliary space where the psi naught single particle wave functions live into the physical space, something that can be represented now by a rectangular matrix. Why a rectangular? Because this bra now live in this space, so they have a higher dimension. Let's say we have nu tilde modes here. So this has dimension two to the nu tilde. But this is still the physical space we start from. So it has the dimension two to the nu. Okay, so now we have a rectangular matrix instead of a square matrix. But you can easily convince yourself that you can do exactly the same steps that we did so far, also with the rectangular lambda matrix, with basically no difference whatsoever. And if you do that, it turns out that you can still formulate the problem as in some quantum embedding scheme, but now the bath gets a bit bigger. It can have a number of bath sites that are still uncorrelated, but for example, you can have three of them instead of just one or more. And you can systematically increase the dimension of this space if you want. Although in the results that I'm going to show you now, one just pick, uh, add two of them. So we have three ghost uh, sites. And in this work, especially the second one of this work, we really focused on uh, mm, identifying some uh, limitation of the GA method and why, and showing also that this uh, generalization on the, uh, of, the, uh, of these answers can cure them and explain also why. Uh, so um, let me just show some benchmark calculations. Uh, that are for uh, the Anderson lattice model in a particular regime that was actually specifically designed for pointing out where the limitations of the GAR. And so 
uh, where the limitations of the GA are somehow magnified. So this is the Anderson lattice model. What this means is that we have some D degrees of freedom that are correlated and there is no hopping between the D degrees of freedom. There are P degrees of freedom that instead are say uncorrelated. Uh, there is no interaction for the P degrees of freedom only for the D. The P and the D can hop one into the other uh, and the P can hop with each other. They don't have interaction, uh, but they are connected uh, through this term to the D modes that instead do have interaction. So that's the Anderson lattice model. So if you take the phase diagram as a function of U and epsilon P, epsilon P is just the level of this P degrees of freedom with respect to the D degrees of freedom. And this is taken uh, for occupation, total occupation, three electrons per site. This is the phase, phase diagram that we get. So we have a phase boundary here uh, that is this blue line. This is obtained with a ghost GA. The gray line is obtained with the bare GA. Oh, I see some question maybe. Okay, so uh, oh, good, very good question. So yeah, um, we don't know yet formally, but we know it numerically. So uh, that this seems to be the case. So yes, it really seems that you take infinite bad size, you should maybe go, get to DMFT, but analytically, I don't have a proof yet. Uh, so if some of you may get one, that would be interesting. But the point is that one can not even really check numerically because just if you add two sides, you basically recover the MFT and we cannot find any difference. So I'm gonna show that now. So the answer to this is that, yes, it's true because of this perspective that we have, we have a variational approximation to the MFT and we expand the variational space, you would expect that eventually you can approach the MFT. Numerically, this seems to be the case, uh, but analytically, I don't have a rigorous proof of it. Yeah, so that's... That's the situation right now, but it's a really new method. So who knows, maybe it's gonna, it's gonna become clear uh, soon. Right. So what you see here is that the, the phase boundary is basically on top of the MFT. The MFT is, this is the UC2. So it's the phase boundary at zero temperature. This is the MFT plus the TQMC. And instead the GA overestimates the critical point uh, by quite a lot in this regime. Again, this was really picked in a regime to, to point out really the limitation of the GA. So it was really to emphasize that. But you can see how this is extremely accurate. So there is some, uh, something really good about, about uh, this particular ansatz that uh, cures one of these limitations that I mentioned in the beginning. I remember in the beginning, I say, what are the limitations of the GA? And the, one of the tools that I mentioned is that it can overestimate the critical point for the mode transition. Uh, but this is not specific just to the, the phase boundaries. So here we look at different observables, total energy, local occupancies of D and P degrees of freedom, double occupancy of the D degrees of freedom. And this thing I call hybridization is just the expectation value of this term. And these green dots are again the MFT with CTQMC solver. And these blue and red lines are this ghost GA. And wait a second, uh, I see more questions. The blue lines was for three auxiliary baths. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's for three ghost modes that corresponds to increasing uh, the bath space by adding two auxiliary orbital modes. Yeah, precisely. Does it, does it clarify? So the blue line, yeah. So, uh, and yeah, with this, uh, this we, we, once we have this, this, this extra degrees of freedom, we are basically on top of, of uh, the MFT, while uh, in the correlated regime, we lose accuracy as we go to higher and higher interaction strength in the bare GA. So it can capture the low, it does capture some non-trivial effects, right? Especially here, the effects is magnified here and that's explained why in the paper, yeah? So, but there are central regimes in, in which the GA is fairly good. And then uh, it can be still very valuable for scanning large spaces. But if you know the limitations, that's even more valuable. And even more if you know how to cure them. So there is a way now for having a controllable level of accuracy. Uh, and I want to point out that this problem is still much less computationally demanding than the MFT, because this is still a finite system and we still need just the ground state. So we can use the MRG, we can use, in the future, maybe we can use quantum computers with variational quantum eigen solvers 
to solve this uh, this this uh, this problem. And so there is a, there are very nice uh, generalizations that are possible. Also from the rotation invariance labels and perspective uh, that could give given even more accurate generalizations, but that's not yet uh, clear. clear. Uh, another thing that we can, can that I mention as a key limitation of the GA is that you don't get a Hubbard mass because I say the self energy cannot have a pole. Well, when you add the cost, you can have also the pole. So on, on the top panels, we have for a particular epsilon p, three different values of u. This corresponds to the weakly correlated metal. This is very close to the moth point, but it's still metal. And this is in the moth phase. This is Gauss GA. And this is uh, the MFT with CTKMC uh, and some uh, method that now I forgot what we use for doing analytical continuation to the real axis. That's always a bit of a choice one has to make. But you can see that uh, the main behavior is really captured. Uh, you can see also details such as, for example, you see the intensity goes down here, right? As exactly as it happens in the MFT. So what you see here, here, these are Hubbard bands. This is the epsilon p band. And below is the projected local density of states with respect to the p and these degrees of freedom. So what you see here is that there is some hybridization in all regimes between p and d, of course, because there is this term here. Uh, and so this is largely an epsilon p band, but it's hybridized, it has some d character. And the features are really very much close to the MFT. And the other bonus to this uh, is that there is some analytical insight because this uh, energy it can be expressed analytically, even for multi-orbital problems. It's not just for this particular model. Always you can express it analytically as a function of the variational parameters. So you can easily understand how all of these features uh, come from. So I wanted to point this out because I talked about uh, how this method uh, can, why it's, it's useful, the computational speed, I explained that there are some limitations to it, but now I also wanted to add that these limitations can be cured. And this is exactly using essentially the same steps that you have learned today. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like, first of all, of course, to thank you for your attention. Maybe I leave you with this slide. And uh, if there are more questions, I can take them. Otherwise, uh, yeah, let me know if there are some questions. Maybe we can wait a few minutes and to give you time to, to write down uh, if you. If you only have one additional ghost mode, does only one Hubbard band appear and two ghost modes? Uh, if you add the two, <clears throat> so yeah, if you add one ghost mode only, you don't, it turns out that you don't improve uh, the description of the metallic phase, but you can capture this, the description of the, the moth phase. Because what happens at the moth transition is that one of these uh, ghost modes becomes uh, inert. It becomes decoupled from the rest. And so you only, only uh, two, the other two remain active. And this happens just directly in the formalism. So what you would see if you just use only two uh, uh, ghost or uh, two bad sides is that you see the moth phase uh, and you can describe it as you have exactly as described here. You don't lose anything for the moth phase, sorry. You don't lose absolutely anything, but you cannot see the improvements that you also see in the metallic phase. So uh, this is... Um, Uh, I am interested in hearing how the GA does for Hunt's metal. Yeah, there are many works on the GA for, for Hunt's metal, including one uh, mine with uh, Luca de Medici and Capone. And uh, it, it does work, especially, uh, so there are details there that uh, one should, uh, should, should keep in mind that are related with the pathologies that only recently we identified in this particular paper. But yes, we have papers where, for example, we solve this, uh, on um, some Hunt's metal on, on a, some multi-orbital Hubbard model. Uh, and that was very good. Uh, you can describe the Hunt's regime. Uh, so where this, there is this flattening of the quasi-particle weight and so on, and the orbital differentiation. And actually I think that the tutorial includes some, uh, some Hunt's metal, uh, isn't it, Yangshin? 
Yeah, I mean, we have the example for the iron and the iron selenide. There is iron selenide, that's an iron, that, that's the Hunt's medal, right? Mm. So uh, you will see something about it. And I believe, I don't know exactly what happens with this uh, particular interface. You may, yeah, the, there is some, uh, uh, I can say that the GA seems to work better when uh, the interaction between the correlated degrees of freedom is direct and not mediated by itinerant degrees of freedom in a way, uh, such as in the Anderson lattice model. And now there is no time for explaining this in full detail, but it's explained in very full detail in this manuscript, in, the, in the, this preprint, very recent things. We have been wondering about it for a long time. But if you take a Hubbard model where you downfold, you really get very good results. Uh, and uh, if you, you can also describe it uh, uh, in a full ab initio ses, ses, uh, uh, fashion in combination with DFT. In this, in this case, the model looks more like an Anderson lattice model. And, uh, and Yangshin will show details about it in the afternoon. Okay. So it appears there are no other questions. Of course, if you have other questions, we have this Slack. Uh, uh now so feel free also uh in the future to ask me anything uh about uh, about this and uh i will be happy uh, uh to answer questions there also <clears throat> 